If it's Wednesday, as federal officials keep quiet about their search of Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump and his allies loudly go on the attack. What it could mean for justice and the Justice Department. Plus, have we finally hit the peak of inflation? A new report shows prices didn't rise last month, but that's hardly relief for struggling Americans. Inflation's still high year over year. We'll dig into what we know and what we don't about where the economy goes from here. And later, we've got primary election results in four states, including Battleground, Wisconsin, as the biggest midterm matchups across America are basically set. Election night, less than three months away. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I am Chuck Todd. We begin with an information vacuum in the midst of a perilous moment in the history of this democracy. It's been two days since the FBI's search of former President Trump's home in Florida. The Justice Department has not said anything publicly about the search. In fact, much of the so-called information that we have right now appears to be coming from inside Trump world. And while the Justice Department is keeping quiet, Donald Trump and a growing number of elected Republicans are ramping up cries of corruption and conspiracy without any evidence. Here's what NBC News has learned from two sources. One is that the search at Mar-a-Lago was related to classified material that former President Trump took from the White House. But there's still so much that we don't know that the Justice Department and presumably Attorney General Merrick Garland do. We also do know there's a sworn affidavit detailing the Justice Department's justification for the search and what they were hoping to find. There's also a search warrant, which might contain a reference to the criminal statute they had probable cause to believe was being violated. And by the way, there's a list of items that the Justice Department left with Mr. Trump and his attorneys that they took. So he knows exactly what they took. But other than that, what we know is sort of standard operating procedure, meaning they don't tell us a lot of information. It's normal. In fact, the whole information vacuum from the Department of Justice is normal. This is how its investigations are normally conducted. But these are not normal times. And this is not a normal investigation. And Donald Trump is not somebody that you would call a normal potential suspect. And as the public awaits for more, uh, more information, Donald Trump has revived a familiar playbook, pushing his own narrative. He's even now baselessly suggesting that federal agents somehow planted evidence during their search. Remember, they were on his property for over nine hours and he waited till the ninth hour to inform us of this. Just something to keep in mind. Today, the former president took another shot at the Department of Justice in a statement announcing that he was invoking the Fifth Amendment in a deposition before lawyers from the New York Attorney General's office as it conducts a separate civil probe of the Trump Organization and its tax uh, and how it made its tax payments. He wrote in part, I once asked, if you're innocent, why are you taking the Fifth Amendment? Now I know the answer to that question, he claims. When your family, your company, and all the people in your orbit have become the targets of an unfounded, politically motivated witch hunt, supported by lawyers, prosecutors, and the fake news media, you have no choice. But do keep in mind that Donald Trump has a record of never cooperating with any investigation when he is a target. He does not willingly tell the truth. Meanwhile, as the Department of Justice is silent, we've seen a chorus of elected Republicans follow the former president's lead and further push his narrative, including people that you would describe as responsible elected officials, or at least somebody would have at one point. Here's Republican Senator Marco Rubio, who is the ranking member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. This is shocking to Americans, but in Latin America and many of these you know, countries around the world, here's what happens. A group takes power. One of the first things that group does is they begin to persecute and go after their political opponents. And then when the supporters of their political opponents begin to complain about it, they begin to target them and they criminalize opposition. And that's what's happening here now. It's quite the charge from Marco Rubio, who is essentially accusing the Biden administration of corrupt intent with the law enforcement agency known as the FBI. If the former president and his allies continue to sow doubt about the legitimacy of our government institutions and our democracy, it is worth asking if it's time for the Justice Department to break their normal protocol to shine more light on Monday's search for the sake of our democracy. Everybody's had to make adjustments to this new information ecosystem 
that we live in and that has been weaponized by Donald Trump and his allies. Joining me now is NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delanian, our senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor is with us, and Andrew Weissman, who served as the FBI's general counsel and was a senior member of the special counsel Robert Mueller's investigative team. He's now an NBC News legal analyst and a professor at NYU Law. I've got a ton of questions for you, Andrew, and I look forward to that. But let me start with Ken and Sahil first. Ken, let me start with um, what we're not hearing, Mm. (laughs) okay, from the Justice Department Department and the FBI. Um, There have been a lot of irresponsible officials out there saying things. But Mitch McConnell has not been one of those people. And he put out a simple statement, reiterated it in public today. He wants an explanation. Um, It's not an unfair ask. What's the Justice Department going to do to respond to at least one responsible lawmaker asking for an update? Probably nothing, Chuck. That's the reality here. It's frustrating for politicians. It's frustrating for Americans. But Merrick Garland and Chris Wray at the FBI have been adamant that they are going to follow the ironclad Justice Department policy, which is you don't talk about pending criminal investigations. And they say that's out of fairness to the people being investigated in case they're never charged. There are also strategic elements here. There may be secret aspects of this investigation, that affidavit is sealed not just to us, it's sealed to Donald Trump's attorney, so they don't know what's in it. Um, so, but, and, and if you want to offer the counterfactual, um, they just point to Jim Comey, because he had the exact same reasoning behind why he had a news conference in July 2016. Here was that they were investigating Hillary Clinton's uh, use of a private email server. Mm-hmm. Um, they weren't going to charge her, but they had found some troubling things. Everybody was talking about it. It was a huge story. He felt like you know, this was a time where we, he could violate policy and have a news conference and describe what they found. Well, that thing had in, in repercussions that no one could have predicted. Some people believe it changed the course of the election. Mm-hmm. And the uh, uh, inspector general of the right. Justice Department excoriated him for doing that, said he violated policy, right. said he cast a pall over the FBI. Merrick Garland does not want to go down that road. I understand that, but the Justice Department also never, uh, never corrected the record about the Steele dossier and allowed the Steele dossier to be essentially part of the narrative of the Mueller report, which we're going to discuss with Andrew Weissman later, which was not true. I mean, by not speaking out sometimes, you allow a phony narrative to take hold. I agree. And they never corrected many um, incorrect stories that were written about the Mueller investigation that led the American public in directions they never should have been led, gave the impression things were going to happen that weren't going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's a terribly frustrating situation. And, you know, for there's... You, people might ask, well, why, well, why can't they just brief key members of Congress mm-hmm. in secret to assuage the concerns like they do with intelligence information to the Gang of Eight? And the response from the Justice Department is the law has no provision for that. In some cases, uh, mm-hmm. many cases, uh, criminal investigations are subject to grand jury secrecy. So the only people that can learn the details are on a list. It's called a 6E list. Yeah. And if you share outside that, you're committing a felony. We live in unusual times. And again, there's no target of an investigation that's ever had the megaphone that Donald Trump has. This is, again, you, you, you know, you, 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 I feel like as if justice is hiding behind um, protocol that made a lot of sense when, you, when newspapers were delivered multiple times a day. Well, that, whether you agree with it or not, it's absolutely a fact that they are getting hammered. As you said, by even by people who purport to be responsible politicians, there is misinformation rife in the land. Millions of people. They know the truth and they're letting. Here's the thing. At the end of the day, Ken, they know the truth. Do you really sit here knowing, knowingly allowing misinformation to essentially take hold? And threats against FBI facilities, against FBI personnel are on the rise. Mm -hmm. This is a climate that we've never seen before. And you're right. I mean, it may call for a reappraisal, but this group of people, this I, cautious group of people, is, yeah. not, is not going there. They're not budging. Yeah. Sil so, Kapoor, uh, it is interesting who's speaking and who's not as a political factor. The, the rush to rally around Donald Trump um, was only surprising in the speed with which folks chose to rally around him. But again, I separate out Mitch McConnell because he seems to be somebody that is trying to, you know, only say anything based on facts. Um, are there others that are sort of echoing McConnell here where they're not going to go down the Marco Rubio road and, and, and claim somehow this is some third world dictatorship that has taken over, but they would like some more information? Well, some of them are being silent about that, Chuck. I think a number of Republicans, especially the senators, are happy that Congress is on recess and they're not having to answer questions <laughs> about this. But it's not just 
Donald Trump's staunchest allies, you know, the Matt Gateses and the Marjorie Taylor Greens that have rushed to his defense. And that is revealing on multiple different levels. It is also Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is being drafted, as you well know, by a number mm -hmm. of conservatives to try to challenge Trump in 2024, rushing uh, to Trump's defense, you know, uh, spreading the, the unfounded conspiracy theories uh, that this is a politically motivated search of Mar-a-Lago. Glenn Youngkin, the governor of Virginia, has mm -hmm. also made that claim that this was politically motivated. This is a man who is uh, in a you know, is leading a, a left-leaning, a blue-leaning state and distance himself from Trump. So I think the fact that so many mm -hmm. Republicans are rushing to rally around Trump shows the power of this issue yeah. with the Republican base. Uh, and it shows that Donald Trump has had years of stirring up the MAGA base with feelings of persecution by claiming right. he is being targeted. We saw it in the Mueller investigation. We saw it through two impeachments. He's doing it again with the uh, January 6th investigation. He's very effective at stirring up the very base yeah. that Republican incumbents need to turn out in the midterms, which is why uh, they're all uh, rallying around him at this moment. So Hill, because it made, we may not know anything from Merrick Garland or Christopher Wray until they're forced to testify on Capitol Hill for some of their usual uh, uh, sort of standing invites that they do before the committees that have oversight over them. Is there a, anything on the books in September for either gentleman? Not that I know of, Chuck. Right now, it is just a race to who's more willing to speculate. And clearly, that race is being won uh, in terms of the megaphone by the, Re the Republicans, by the, you know, the, the Trump allies yeah. in particular, as well as party leaders. Democrats are... Uh, they don't really know what to say about this. They've been caught like a deer in the headlights politically yes. by this, and they are unwilling to speculate before they know the facts. We've seen Speaker Pelosi, we've seen Senator Chuck Schumer say right. it's premature to comment on this. Uh, and, you know, they would rather talk about the reconciliation bill, other, you know, legislative items that they're on a hot streak over. They don't want to be talking about this. Well, right. It's sort of the idea that somehow Democrats are pushing this. If you actually look at the political narrative, it doesn't make any sense that the Biden team would be pushing this in this moment. That's for sure. Um, before I let both of you go, Ken, Scott Perry, this cell phone, that gets thrown in. Yeah. On, this appears to be a January 6th related yes. subpoena. Um, is there anything more than that? Search warrant, I believe. They seized his phone, and he's the third now member of this uh, group of people who are plotting to overturn the election whose phone has been seized. It's a reminder that this January 6th grand mm -hmm. jury investigation is 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 moving along at a rapid pace and doing some pretty dramatic things. Do we think these are separate probes of Trump, the January 6th probe and this probe, or do we think there is one person that is sort of or one entity that sort of is dealing with all federal the all the federal cases involving Donald J. Trump? Well, they both come under the National Security Division of the Justice Department. Ultimately, these may be separate grand juries, but we can't rule out that there is a link to January 6th somewhere down there in those Mar-a-Lago right. documents. All right. I've teased it long enough. Now I'm moving on to Andrew Weissman, Kendallanian. Uh, always a pleasure, sir. Uh, Sahil Kapoor, thank you. All right, Mr. Weissman, uh, you heard where I was going to go. And I go to the Steele dossier as to me would be my exhibit A as to why justice should change its protocols. And when there's misinformation, say so. So let me just start there. I know what the protocols say. Do you think we live in an environment where justice should be think, rethinking those protocols? Uh, I do, um, but I think it's I think nuance is needed here. I don't think it's it's black and white. Um, it's really important to stress what uh, Ken said, which is that protecting the ongoing investigation and protecting the civil liberties of those people under investigation. Um, who may never be charged or what animate the DOJ policy. And I think both of those are very strong reasons that you have to be very circumspect in what you say. That being said, um, here's the big but on that, which is the counter to the Jim Comey example, which is obviously the thing that we can all agree should never happen. Um, that that is sort of the, the, the key thing that you want to avoid is a prosecutor just deciding, I'm going to give my personal views of somebody who's never been charged. Yep. That shouldn't happen. But a counter to that would be um, during Watergate when you had the special prosecutor um, actually giving a press conference explaining why he was seeking tapes and what the conundrum was and why he took this legal position. Um, where you have an investigation that is already public and you have the target making it public, 
the sort of concerns about the civil liberties of that person mm -hmm. fade away because they have decided um, to make it public. In the same way that, you know, the Mueller report was not um, issued by Robert Mueller. It was given privately, as is required, to the attorney general. And then the attorney general with the White House decided to make it public. So it is possible to comment on things and to give information. Um, and I do think that the attorney general or spokesperson for the attorney general could at least um, try and diffuse some of the sort of rank speculation yeah. and give some guidance to the public about what's going on. Um, it's really clear to me that um, there has to be some serious evidence that was uncovered. And of course, Donald Trump knows it, because if he's already saying, wait a second, I think the FBI planted stuff, that's clearly going to be his defense, um, because he right. knows um, that he was actually lying about having turned everything over. And he needs to have some defense to the fact that they found stuff there. Right. And, and Andrew, I was it was interesting to me that he knows everything they took. Correct me if I'm wrong, right? They leave a list of everything they took. There's a whole, as you will, of, of, of what, what was taken off of the property. So Donald Trump and his lawyers know exactly every piece of evidence taken from Mar-a-Lago, correct? Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, it is true that the FBI is required to leave what is called a return, which is a list, an inventory of what was taken. But, you know, um, Donald Trump and his lawyers don't need that. They actually knew beforehand True. what was on the premises <laughs> because it was exclusively within Donald Trump's possession so he can see what's missing. Um, but in addition to that, yes, the FBI leaves a list. So if he wants to claim that there was no uh, government property there, um, you know, he's free to make mm -hmm. that public. And, the, you know, to your point is in this situation where the, Donald Trump is saying all of that, what is the good reason why the FBI can't make that public? And what you're saying is it's hard because, again, it's sort of like I think we go through this. He's essentially waiving whatever privileges that the Justice Department does feel like they owe a target. And he himself it, has waived exactly. those privileges, correct? Exactly. And this is different than, let's say, the January 6th investigation, where there are multiple people who could be the subject or targets of that investigation. It would be very hard to know that everyone is waving. But here, where it's clear that there's a singular focus and um, you have that person uh, uniquely in a position to wave, um, there's at least some reason um, to give some statements to the public and a reassurance um, that the rule of law was was um, followed right. and to make sure the public understands what's happening. A, a really good example of this is during the special counsel investigation, a lot of us on the inside were saying, why is the Justice Department not making it clear that we could never indict the, a sitting president and to sort of avoid that expectation? Hmm. And there was just no reason that there wasn't more of an educational function being served by the Department of Justice Having said all this, Chuck, this is a great academic conversation, yeah. but I agree with Ken, which is that I think Merrick Garland and Lisa Monaco are going to be very by the book here. And although these might make a lot of sense, uh, I think it's going to be they would think very long and hard before they sort of open the Pandora's box here. I look, that's that's my default on this. I think that's the default of any sort of rational sort of observer of this town and, and know how this works. And you would assume those two people in particular understand the explosive nature of, say, doing this over paperwork. Correct? Yeah, uh, absolutely. But I do think, you know, Merrick Garland has talked about trying to not repeat mistakes that were made in the past. And I do think the asymmetry of the rules where the people who are subjects and targets get to speak, but the people in the department mm -hmm. don't is something that I do think can be rethought. And I do think the Archibald Cox example is something worth, uh, you know, Merrick Garland considering. I, look, you heard the example I brought up. How much do you wish you could have sort of pushed back in some misinformation during your investigation? A, a, a certain amount. I mean, of, of course, you the, the question of how much do you, I wish I could, of course, you wish you could respond to everything. 
but I do think that you know there is a balance here because you do have to worry about civil liberties and the, protecting the ongoing investigation. But I do think that there is an educational function, um, at least around the edges, mm -hmm. that is useful, if only to educate the public about why the Department of Justice can mm -hmm. only speak a certain amount and not more. And, an, and a search warrant is probably executed in this country at least once a day, somewhere, if not more. Uh, or more. Exactly. Or more. Yes. So it, there is nothing wrong with talking in very general terms about something that is somewhat commonplace in our legal system. Andrew Weissman, uh, always a pleasure to get your expertise. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you. And don't miss my interview with former U.S. Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez. We talk justice, Trump, and more. Today's episode of the Chuck Toddcast, available wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up, as inflation finally peaked, key report out today has President Biden in a cautiously optimistic mood, even though prices are still sky high. But apparently they've hit a ceiling, we hope. Experts weigh in next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Today, we received news that our economy had 0% inflation in the month of July. 0%. We're seeing a stronger labor market where jobs are booming and Americans are working. And we're seeing some signs that inflation may be getting to moderate. Ah, May beginning to moderate. That's the key. Is this going to continue? As the Biden administration and the country battle high inflation, President Biden was celebrating today's Consumer Price Index numbers, what is now a monthly uh, report that political strategists are obsessed with these days. It showed consumer prices up 8.5% year over year. But the big news was no change in the inflation rate from the month of June of this year to July. So that's good news. So compared to June... Food prices rose just over 1%, and housing prices increased only a half a percent. But that was offset by both by a decline in gas prices and energy prices overall. Markets, of course, welcomed the news. Dow closed in the green, up over 500 points, and the S&P 500 reaching its highest level since May. But prices may remain high for people across the country. And the question is, how do we get out of this wage growth and avoid inflation with it. I'm joined now by economist Omer Sharif, founder and president of Inflation Insights, uh, aptly named for our segment today, Mr. Sharif. So let me simply start with this. You, you seem to be cautiously optimistic that perhaps we've hit the peak, but even you seem a bit measured. Explain. Yeah, so, uh, you know, some of what we got today was obviously uh, weakness in gasoline prices. That's likely to continue. But as you showed, food prices are still rising. Rents are still rising. When you kind of strip out some of the very high increases we saw today and some of the weakness, what you get sort of in, in the middle of this price change distribution is, you know, an annualized run rate that's still about 6%. That's still far too high and well above the Fed's 2% target. So I think this is sort of the very, you know, sort of this is a kind of the first baby step we need to see mm -hmm. uh in terms of getting more and more reports like this but i don't think we, you know it's a little too early to sort of declare mission accomplished uh just because the june report was zero today we've, we've sort of got a long ways to go here in terms of getting overall inflation lower for the consumer going forward and let me be more pessimistic uh we we threw all of we threw whatever we could at the price of gas over the last 60 days is this the best we could hope for You see what I mean? No, like, in fact, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it looks like August is actually going to be even weaker in terms of gasoline prices than what we saw, yeah. uh, you know, in, in July. So that's going to be beneficial for the consumer going forward. Um, but, you know, I, we, there's a good chance we get down to about 375, maybe 370 over the next few weeks uh, in terms of gasoline. So. I, think, I still think there's a little bit of extra relief coming to the consumer uh, in terms of. All right. Well, let's talk about the bigger picture. You talked about we're still sitting at about six percent on an annualized basis. Not good. We've got this hot jobs market. And in order to get people to take a bunch of jobs that fo that companies are struggling to fill, they're raising wages. That's all good. But obviously, if we keep having more money chasing and we still have this supply chain issue, how do we avoid that cycle? 
Yeah, so I think we think about it in two different ways. So one is what you're talking about, which is, you know, people make more money, they go out and spend it, demand goes up and prices go up with it. I actually don't think that's really the channel we're seeing right now because real wage growth has been declining for the better part of a year. Um, so nominal wages are rising, inflation is rising faster. So you're basically getting less bang for each buck that you make. The other side of this, which is I think a bit more relevant to the inflation story is that the entire cost structure of operating your business has increased. So it's not just wages that are going up, it's you know transportation costs, logistics, mm -hmm. everything else across the board. So in this high inflation environment, firms have sort of just you know gone ahead and passed a lot of this on to the consumer. So to me, that is that's kind of the bigger story here in terms of the inflation push we've seen over the last year. Um, you know, some when you sort of think about inflation in the aggregate, um, there's certain components that obviously demand has increased. We've seen it for vehicles, uh, you know, we've seen it for shelter, uh, but in other areas, it is definitely more supply side. And I think once we kind of get that, you know, that cost structure under control a little bit more, uh, we should start to see inflation cool off a bit more, but demand has been moderating. I mean, we can see that in, yeah. you know, the amount of food people are buying, uh, the amount of goods being purchased. So that side of it, I think, at least is reacting a little bit to what the Fed's been doing for the better part of the, of the last six months. The only quick question I have that's left, though, is 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 the only thing left in the non in the government toolbox that doesn't belong to the Fed um, opening the doors on immigrant labor? I think that would certainly help. Look, we've got a supply shortage in terms of labor. Uh, all you have to do is look at vacancies. All you have to do is look at small businesses saying, hey, we need to hire more people. Um, I think that would certainly help. Um, and, you know, we've sort of taken a step here in terms of in, uh, reducing the deficit. And I think doing that uh, could also sort of further help to kind of put a cap on inflation moving forward. All right. Uh, Omer Sharif uh, of Inflation uh, Insights, one of the experts on the topic of inflation. Mr. Sharif, really appreciate you coming on, sharing your expertise with us. Up next, another primary win for Trump and another overperformance for Democrats. What it all means for November. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. If it's Wednesday, it means we've got some election results. But first, a race from last Tuesday, eight days ago, was just decided last night. Washington State Republican incumbent member of Congress, uh, Congress Jamie Herrera Butler, who voted to impeach President Trump, one of ten, House Republicans to do that, will not advance to the general election in the state's top two primary system. Her Trump-backed challenger, Joe Kent, eked out the second place finish. As of right now, just two of the 10 House Republicans who backed impeachment will definitely be on the ballot in November. The only remaining wild card is Liz Cheney, whose primary is next week. Now, in last night's races, Republicans won a special election in Minnesota, holding on to that seat. However, it was a four-point margin. In a district, Donald Trump won by 10 points. So it suggests that Republicans may have less of an advantage in November, especially after the Supreme Court decision on, abo on abortion. This is actually the second straight special election where Democrats have overperformed in a uh, pretty solid Republican district. There was a special in Nebraska just after Dobbs that showed a similar finding. Now, Minnesota is also now the latest state where the Republican running to oversee the next presidential election has backed former President Trump's uh, false claims about the last one. Kim Crockett, who called the 2020 election rigged and a train wreck, won, officially won her party's nomination for Secretary of State. Obviously, Minnesota still somewhat leans blue, particularly in midterm years. In Wisconsin, a mixed bag for Trump's preferred candidates. The State House Speaker Robin Voss, who was targeted late in this election cycle by Trump for not pursuing his election conspiracies enough. He pursued him some, but not enough for Donald Trump. Voss was able to narrowly win his primary against a Trump-backed challenger. But in the gubernatorial primary, the Republicans nominated Trump's choice, Tim Michaels, to take on incumbent Governor Tony Evers. For what it's worth, Michaels was not as Trumpy as some of the other Trump-backed candidates in other states on that front. In the Senate primary, as expected, Democrats nominated Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes to take on the incumbent Republican senator there, Ron Johnson, in what promises to be one of the cycle's marquee matchups in the fight for control of the Senate. Wisconsin, arguably the most polarized state in the nation, and it's given us two candidates who certainly will fire up their bases. Folks, with these Wisconsin primaries in the books, most of the big races of the fall are set. We're basically missing the state of Florida, and that comes in two weeks. And I think we've learned anything from these primary fights in the last couple of months. It's that the midterms in November are going to be unlike any other midterm we've had 
in a generation in American politics. This is a much different scenario than any of us thought we were signing up for when this year began. Joining me now, our man in Big Ten country these days is Shaquille Brewster. So, Shaq, uh, you spent a lot of time in Wisconsin. You've done it multiple cycles now. It, it feels like Wisconsin is a never-ending political battle, whether in a primaries, sometimes between the, inside the parties, or between the two parties. I, it feels like we should expect more of the same. Yeah, when you hear from the candidates, everyone expects it to be close. This is a purple state. This is a state that gets national attention and you'll have a flood of national money and com- money coming into. You know, one thing that we heard from Governor Evers earlier today, he told me that he expects the margin uh, this time around in his battle against Tim Michaels to be as tight as it was four years ago when he beat Governor Scott Walker. That margin, Chuck, was about one percentage point. So we are in for a big battle. And then you mentioned on the Democratic side, for that Senate nomination. Uh, Landella Barnes getting the nomination there, but will now face Ron Johnson, who, yes, is behind in polling, is not favorable right now when you look at those poll numbers, but he's someone, when he won the past two elections here, the past two cycles, he out he overperformed and was able to eke by. Uh, we'll see what happens in November, Chuck. It's going to be close, and that's what everyone's telling us. I'll tell you, it does, you know, one thing about Ron Johnson is, is I, it's pretty clear now, two cycles in a row, that his supporters... Uh, don't always tell pollsters that they support him. Hey, very quickly, uh, on, yeah. uh, on the Scott Walker front. Scott Walker, this was not a proxy fight between Trump and Pence. This was a proxy fight between Trump and his one-time presidential primary foe, Scott Walker. Scott Walker was very aggressive in helping Rebecca Clayfish here. What does this mean for Walker's yeah. hold on the Wisconsin Republican Party now? Yeah, Chuck, he was extremely aggressive. We're not just talking about radio ads, but television ads where he was talking directly to camera. You also had him flying across the state with Rebecca Clayfish. You know, that was something I asked him. If we woke up Wednesday morning and his preferred candidate didn't win, what did that mean for the party and what did that mean for his legacy? And he tried to downplay it, Mm -hmm. saying that it's about conservatives and he would still back Michaels. But that's an open question now. I mean, it's very clear. This is Trump's party. You mentioned uh, Robin, uh, the speaker, uh, the Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, he did win his primary, but he only won it by about 200 votes, Chuck. It is going to be extremely close here. You know, Scott Walker's, uh, uh, what he just went through with Donald Trump might be a lesson for a guy named Ron DeSantis in Florida. Be careful, no matter how big of a fish you think you are in your state, you never know when the kingfish shows up. Shaquille Brewster in Wisconsin, Shaq, thank you. Folks, it's only Wednesday, and wow, it's already been a week in politics, battleground primaries, historic legislation, and oh, by the way, that dramatic FBI search of the former president's uh, Florida home. The panel digs into it all next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As Trump quickly politicized the FBI search of his Florida home, Republicans, many of them, fell in line with his narrative, even one who was initially calling for caution. Here was South Carolina Senator Tim Scott Tuesday morning on his book tour when asked about the FBI search warrant. I think we should really, as, as opposed to rushing the judgment, the most important thing that we can do is let it play out because I, I have right. no idea what they were looking yeah. for. And I don't think anybody knows uh, what they were looking point, for. I- Pretty reasonable position there. Hours later, though, Scott tweeted this. The FBI raid on Mar-a-Lago was without question shocking, stunning, and unprecedented. All Americans, regardless of political stripes, should be deeply concerned by their actions. If they can target a former president, they can target me and you. Joining me now is our panel, Eugene Scott, national political reporter for The Washington Post. Democratic strategist uh, Sochi Inosa and Republican strategist Brad Todd. All right, Brad, the Tim Scott. Why do you think he felt the need to have to tweet that out, a much more aggressive response versus the one that seemed to be the response you would assume most elected officials would vote. I don't know anything about it. Let's wait and see. Because within a couple of hours, the FBI leak said this was about paperwork. And so if it's really about classified information, by the way, which the president has broad authority to declassify documents that he possesses, Mm -hmm. if it's really just about paperwork, then this was overkill. Wall Street Journal said it perfectly today. And if it's about more than paperwork, then we have a much bigger problem because the FBI is not coming clean about what it's trying to do. You're automatically, 
What you're saying is it's okay to assume the worst about the FBI without evidence. No, the FBI, well, the FBI has an obligation as, in a prosecution of a high-ranking government official. It has the obligation to build the confidence of the entire country as it goes along. So it's, the burden is on the FBI and on Merrick Garland to be very transparent about their objectives, what they're doing, and why. And currently, we don't have that from the FBI. So therefore, we have an institution that has been pretty politically motivated when it comes to this president from the start, since before he ran for office. So of course, it's right to be skeptical in the absence of any more transparency. Go ahead, I Sosia. highly disagree. As someone who was a Justice Department official for many years, I will tell you, Justice Department rules say that you cannot confirm an ongoing investigation, and that is what Attorney General Garland is finding and the FBI are finding himself. I want to remind you, these are career professionals at the FBI that were carrying out a raid that was, um, and, and they report to the FBI director that was, you know, who was selected by Trump. I think the attorney general here, he has his hands tied. He cannot say much. Neither can the FBI when it comes to this. And so people will have to wait and see. I know that is extremely frustrating, mm -hmm. but it is Trump that has the warrant at this point. He wanted to release more information. He could release more information. But the onus is not on the Justice Department to explain more because they can't explain more because they are a law enforcement agency. So, Eugene, it is this conversation right here, mm -hmm. which is why I think that everybody has to be a lot more transparent. The fact of the matter is we live in a different world. We don't live in the world of Elliot Ness. Sure. I mean, transparency is helpful and valuable, but at this point in the investigation and what happened, I, the idea that we would know all of the answers to our questions by now is ludicrous. And it's mind blowing to me that anyone thinks that uh, putting more information out, be it Trump releasing the warrant or the FBI coming out and saying more would give most Americans confidence in what is happening. People have so many issues regardless of their political stripes yeah. with the FBI and law enforcement. I, I guess I look at it this way. It's like, look, this is not about, you're not going to please 100% of everybody. No, or, or maybe even but there's, 50. But I'm looking at 15. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking at 15. 15. You have somebody who's weaponizing this. Mm -hmm. If you know misinformation is out there, should a government agency, if they knowingly, if they see misinformation essentially circulating, shouldn't they, and they have the ability to correct the record, shouldn't they? They need to do what their process tells them is in their best interest to make sure that this is ha handled appropriately and fairly and justly. Misinformation, it's unavoidable. We live in a day and age where misinformation will always be put out. The idea that we should have to respond to that quickly mm -hmm. just because people want to put out lies or, yeah. or create mistrust. Look, I, I, I do think there's an irresponsibility here to a lot of elected leaders, a lot of elected Republicans. Mitch McConnell's not being one of those. He's keeping his powder dry. Why do you think so many elected Republicans aren't keeping their powder dry here? Well, I right. think I think Merrick I just Garland, did to you what people do to me. Mar 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 Merrick Garland, first off, doesn't have a good track record. He's the track record of being a part of, a knee jerk partisan throughout his tenure. Here. How? Whoa, whoa, wait. In fairness, how? How is that? I want, I want you can look at what he did. You can look at what he did with school boards. You can look at Mer Merrick Garland has not been anything but the moderate we were promised when he was appointed nominated to the Supreme Court years ago. He's turned out to be a, a very as much a partisan as Eric Holder ever was. And so the question in this situation is. Everyone wants to, on the left, wants to wrap Donald Trump for breaking norms. And sometimes those criticisms are correct. But here we have an administration that is also breaking a norm, and Demo the same Democrats are cheering it on. And if he wants to prosecute Donald Trump, if he believes Donald Trump might have done something wrong, he's going to have to win over a bunch of the American people to do mm -hmm. it. A clear majority, maybe a super majority of the American people. This is not a, any kind of an action that would ever take place in court. It would take place in the court of public opinion. And Sochi, this is to me, though, which, which is... You, I, I, I do not believe you can hide behind normal protocols here. This is not a normal situation. And more importantly, as I said, to, to Andrew Weissman seemed to agree with this. Whatever you think of Donald Trump, he's waived his right to these privileges by deciding to go public with it. So to me, he's given an invitation to the Justice Department and the FBI. Well... We weren't going to say anything, but he chose to. So the invitation well, is there. DOJ rules don't have an exception for a Donald Trump of the world. But, but what yes, I will, they do. But, they're nothing but exception. I, I don't mean to go off on a rant <laughs> here, but it really bugs me. This is like the ridiculous unwritten rules of baseball. The Justice Department has all these protocols, except if it's 90 days to an election, except if it's 60 days, except if it's this. Unless somebody does something wrong, then the protocol doesn't matter. I don't know what they but are. Nobody does. So here is here is. Attorney General Garland gets it from both sides. You had Democrats just a few months ago mm -hmm. who were saying he wasn't doing enough. He, they were saying that he needed to be more aggressive on this investigation, et cetera. 
Now you have Republicans who are upset because of the raid and what had happened, and they're not blaming necessarily the FBI. They're blaming Attorney General Garland. And But the reality is, is that when you are upsetting both sides of the aisle, you know that you are being independent. You know, he is taking, he doesn't care what anybody says. I, unfortunately, Merrick Garland mm-hmm. is not watching this panel right now, and he doesn't care what you right. or I or anyone else says. He is listening to the career attorneys at the Department of Justice about what they should be doing, and that is going to frustrate everybody, but he is doing it because it is the right thing to do, and he's following the rules of the press. No, they're not. Justice. They're leaking to the press as it is. If they can't speak, yeah, then they can't. They're not leaking to the press. I wish they were, because we'd have more information. They're not. They're being the the leaker here is everything in the Trump world, and they're defining. And that's the other part of this, Eugene. Is is again? I go back to. Um, he's a different animal than we've ever dealt with before. This is not normal. It, George W. Bush wouldn't operate this way. Barack Obama wouldn't operate this way. I, I think Bill Clinton and LBJ wouldn't have operated this way. I, you know, we could have historians argue a different point. Donald Trump are, is more than willing to sort of operate this way. I, I think the idea of just standing back and not combating this seems like you're going to have the Mueller report all over again. Well, why would he take a different approach if you're going to have this many Republican lawmakers come out and defend him, despite not even knowing the details? It's and astonishing. So, and so many of his voters still backing him. And even if all of the information was out, even if we know based on how we've seen Trump's presidency go in the time afterwards, even if all of the information was out mm-hmm. and facts and it pointed to Donald Trump being worse than some of these individuals imagine, many of these people would still defend him. So why would he have any incentive to operate differently? How important is this? been to fundraising in the last 24 hours for Republicans, Brad? Well, Donald Trump has his skeptics on the Republican side, plenty of them. Mm-hmm. But where they are united with Donald Trump's supporters is when the Democrats or the national media give Donald Trump an unfair shake. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's when Republicans will rally to Donald Trump, even those who are skeptical of him. And what is one thing? There's about, no evidence that this is unfair yet. Well, but it's There's precedent none. breaking. It's precedent breaking. We also Donald been Trump's given, precedent we've also, breaking. We've also been giving, given no, no good reason by the FBI or the Department of Justice what it's for. And so we also know it's never been done to any president before. Has anyone ever of his stature been prosecuted under the Presidential Records Act of 1978? The answer is no. The answer is no. And so have we ever had a former president do what he did? The answer is no. Well, I the mean, executive that's the point. Order, his two, middle name is unprecedented. Two, two different presidents revised the executive orders for how to even implement the Presidential Including Records Act. Including this the former president signed a law that actually raises the prison term from one year to five. Right. He did that for classified information because he was obsessed with putting Hillary Clinton in jail. But the question you ask is, what about Republicans? And the answer is, if the Democrats are throwing the full weight of the force mm-hmm. of the federal government to try and get Donald Trump, that will rally Republicans, it's, even those skeptical of him. It's not the Democrats By the way, we're either. seeing this, yeah. Sochi. But we are. Merrick Garland's yeah, I mean, a Democrat. The DOJ I, staffed by Democrats. A Democrat the White House is not given a heads up. This is this mm-hmm. is a DOJ no one acting believes independent. That. No well, one believes that. That is very true. That no, is what happens. No and American Working at the that. Department of Justice, there are very few instances you give the White House a heads up on any sort of action. Do you believe um, Christopher Wray gave Donald Trump all sorts of I heads up all the time? I can't believe anybody would go after a former president of the United States without letting the White House know it's coming. If they didn't, the president ought to have their head. Why? Why would? Why would you put the White House in that position? Why would you department? allow your Department of Justice, your Attorney General, to divide the country in half on a fishing expedition? You shouldn't. You're assuming it's a fishing expedition. Well, then they should clarify it. Well, and I think that's where we're all cut. Well, you and I are in agreement on that. I still don't understand why you think it's good for them not to clarify what this is about. I don't. I'm not saying whether this is good or bad for them. I don't think that they care. I don't think that they are well, going they to. Care. I, well, I don't think that they feel that because there is outside pressure to do so, that mm-hmm. that is going to drive their decision to release more information. I'm saying what Attorney General Garland is looking at is what his career attorneys are saying, what the DOJ rules are, and that's yeah. super frustrating for all of us. Yeah. That's the reality. Well, I think they're hiding. Like I said, they're hiding behind some old rules conveniently here. Eugene, Sochi, Brad, this is this is animating. <laughs> it's a quiet August here in Washington. Still to come, I'm going to speak with Democratic Congresswoman Susan uh, Susan Delbaney. Uh, She joins me on set just days after traveling to Taiwan on a high-stakes trip with Speaker Pelosi. Interview is next after a quick break. Welcome back. After several weeks of increased tensions, China says it has completed its military exercises around Taiwan, but says it will regularly conduct drills in the area going forward. These latest maneuvers were part of a show of force after House Speaker Nancy Pelosi led a congressional delegation to Taipei, 
against the wishes of Beijing. So joining me now is one of the members of that delegation to Taiwan, Washington Democratic Congresswoman uh, Susan Del Bene. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, it's good to, ha- good to see you. Good so to let be me here. let me start with what did you learn in Taiwan? Look, I, I, we know all the stories about it and, and, and the, the decision by China to be outraged. But what did you learn about, what did you learn in Taiwan about um, the threat and how concerned the average person living in Taiwan is with China right now? Well, we did a trip across the region. We were in Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan, um, South Korea, and Japan. Mm-hmm. And, uh, w- but when we landed in Taiwan, which was late in the evening, Um, I guess hundreds of thousands of people had been tracking the flight. There were photographers and Mm -hmm. and the public out. We were, um, when we left the airport just past midnight, there were thousands of people on the street um, welcoming us. Mm -hmm. So um, the people Did it feel bigger? The the people of Taiwan were very excited. This wasn't um, like Singapore, you got a few waves, but this was different, right? right? This was different. This was different. This was uh, uh, just a, I think the people of Taiwan were very thankful that we came. Um, We were going to come earlier in the Mm -hmm. year and Speaker Pelosi got COVID, so we had to delay the trip. But, um, you know, Taiwan's an important partner. The whole region is an important region. Um, The president has highlighted this region with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and the U.S.-Taiwan um, initiative for 21st century trade. There's a lot of work happening, and we wanted to go build on that and talk to folks in the region and engage as legislators. And we saw this become something even bigger and maybe more important. People were incredibly excited that we came. Do you get a sense from our allies in, in Southeast Asia in particular, um, but particularly the countries you went to, um, that... We know what side they want to be on. They want to be with the West. They want to be in a rules-based system. But China's in their backyard. And they have to tolerate them. Look at the decision the South Korean president made by just doing a, phoning it in, trying to somehow balance diplomacy. What more does the United States need to do in the region to convince these people who want, these countries who would rather be with us, but think, I don't know if they're going to be there when, when, I don't know if the U.S. is going to be there when China comes for us. Well, we had three main goals on the trip. It was security, economy, and governance. And I'm the vice chair of the Ways and Means Committee, so Mm -hmm. I was there primarily talking about the economic partnership. Mm -hmm. And folks are very focused on that. That's a key part of what we can do in the region is have strong relationships and strong economic relationships, um, strong supply chains, um, arrangements so that there isn't a dependency on any one country, Mm -hmm. but um, folks have economic opportunities broadly. And so the Indo-Pacific economic framework was very, very important for folks because that was one way we can continue as a region um, to engage with the region and make sure that we have strong alliances, look at things like how we are going to jointly address climate, what we can do jointly mm-hmm. in terms of trade. Um, and the, the, that ongoing relationship is part of addressing um, the kind of ongoing um, questions from the region about making sure we're going to be there and we're going to be strong economic partners and strong partners overall. Does this, um, what China did, this show of force, and, uh, does it at all, do you feel as if the United States needs to respond at some point? Not immediate, because it's all about de-escalation in the current week. Um, but do you think that we need to make it clear, maybe more weapons to Taiwan in the near term? Well, I think um, we responded by going. Um, as mm-hmm. the speaker said, we're right. not going to have our schedule determined by folks in uh, the People's Republic of China. We're going to make our own schedule, and we support the people of Taiwan. And and that's an ongoing relationship, an ongoing relationship there, an ongoing relationship with the region. That's part of the work we're going to continue to do. And we can look at what we can do, again, with these ongoing relationships right. and agreements um, to strengthen that, not only in the economy, but also ongoing security relationships, too. Uh, you're a member of Congress from Washington State. It, uh, we just finally called the Jamie Herrera Butler race. She did not make it into the top two. This is uh, Southern Washington State District. It's a Republican-leaning district. It's, it's, she would have been very hard to dislodge. Um, this is a Trump-backed candidate in Joe Kent. Um, is this a race you think the Democratic Party will target? Well, we have a strong Democratic candidate. Um, she actually won the primary overall. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's a first-time candidate, has been doing a great job. And so um, I think she has a great chance. And, uh, so are you trying to encourage the party to spend money there nationally? 
Well, I think it's an important district, and definitely as someone locally, um, we're going to do what we can to help support her effort. All right. Congresswoman uh, Suzanne Del Bene, good to see you. Thanks. Good to see you. Glad to have you back, and glad that the trip was safe. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and thank you all for being with us this hour. I'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. NBC News Now coverage continues with Tom Costello 